Broadcasting live to the world, now, it's Sheila Zielinski. Sheila Zielinski Show, the only show to give you the truth behind the headlines, prophecy, and the deeper things of God. Now, here is your host, End Time Watchwoman, Sheila Zielinski. Hi everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Sheila Zielinski Show We are rapidly approaching the end of 2015. Of course, tonight joining me is the renowned Dr. Tom Horn. So excited to have him on. Now, before he comes on, folks, I want to remind you that I did an amazing show. I was able to do a roundtable with four amazing men, Mark Morano from Climate Depot, Christopher C. Horner, New York Times bestselling author of Red Hot Lies, and also Dr. Calvin Beisner and Dr. Timothy Balderam, now in climatologist, had four amazing men on the Climate Roundtable. So just go to YouTube and definitely listen to that show. It's also on the podcast. Incredible roundtable discussion with four brilliant men as they were in Paris. I do not want you to miss that show. So please do find it on the archives. And if you have not signed up for my podcast, do so so that you can listen to that show as well. Don't forget to add me on YouTube. Social media tabs are there in the top right at weekendvigilante.com. My guest tonight really needs no introduction, but for the new listeners, it is the highly acclaimed Dr. Tom Horn, the renowned best-selling prophecy author from Skywatch TV, very well-known radio personality who's hosted and appeared in hundreds of radio and television shows over the last 30 years, and it is such... A pleasure to have him back on, as he is my personal favorite. Dr. Tom Horn, welcome back to the program. Hey, Sheila, always great to be on with you, and thank you very much for being patient for me to get off this most recent trip to get back here so we could do this. Well, I appreciate your time, Tom. Tom, when I saw the front cover of Time magazine back in February 2011, I was stunned beyond speech, and I don't think I've recovered since. The caption was, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. And as I read through this, I became completely horrified, Tom, and I couldn't get the thought out of my head, and I haven't since, that we are really dealing with the end of mankind as we know it. Now, this is no longer the stuff of science fiction. This is what we are calling transhumanism. It's unfolding before us. Now, Tom, you just released a very long-awaited, highly anticipated documentary, Inhuman, a shocking foray into realms of the terrifying, is what I call it. Tell us what this is, Tom, and how you got started on this project. Yeah, and by the way, that Time Magazine article you're referring to, they're going to have to update that because that was Kurzweil, Mr. Singularity himself, his original predictions were that by 2045 we will have reached technological singularity and immortality. We'll have nanobots swimming around in our brain. A lot of people now, though, are saying that he was too conservative. 2015 was a breakthrough year in artificial intelligence, and now people are thinking that we're not going to have to wait another 30 years, that within 5 to 10 years we may reach technological singularity. Now, that's only one aspect of transhumanism. Probably some of the stuff that's even more important right now are the issues that we included in the film In Human, the documentary, that have to do with human gene editing technology. Uh, If people go to Google and just type in CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, they can read all about that and why um, just this last week we actually had leading scientists from around the world that gathered in Washington, D.C. These were scientists from China, uh, Russia, the United Kingdom, and America all coming together. What were they doing in Washington, D.C.? They were talking about CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Uh, that allows for the modification of humans at the germline level. We can talk all about that as we do this program. Uh, That's partly what we deal with in the film Inhuman. And now, 
this all started out kind of innocently enough. There's too much to the story to tell, but basically a decade or more ago, um, really kind of at the dawn of the Internet, when the Internet was really just starting to put in some of its AI, Google-like uh, programs that would allow for searching the web, um, I was actually writing an article for one of the largest newspapers uh, out of Oklahoma City, and on the subject, by the way, of Halloween, so it didn't have anything to do with this other than the fact that it's scary, right? <laughs> and I came across the term. So I'm on the Internet, I'm searching, I forget what for, but I saw a term. The term was transgenics. And a decade ago, you know, I had never heard of this word before. I didn't even know what they were talking about, except that in my mind, I could kind of put it together. Trans. Genics. We are somehow here talking about the blending of different kind of species. We're talking about crossing over species barriers, combining one kind of a creation with another kind of a creation in ways that if you're an evolutionist, this was not allowed for by Darwinian evolution, or if you're a, a religious person, this was not allowed for by creation or God. So we were doing something here unnatural. So I wanted to follow up on it. So I wrote my article for the Oklahoma newspaper. And then I really started researching this term transgenics. And early on, some of the successes, NASA uh, created, you know, remember uh, all the stories about the spider goat? Right. That right. was one of their early transgenic creations where they took a goat and combined its genetic makeup with the DNA of a spider in order to create silk inside the milk of a goat. So that's what they were doing. And I wanted to know more. Well, I wrote some editorials, to make a long story short, that kind of went viral on the Internet at that time where I was raising concerns about the uses of genetics to make modifications to any species, including, God forbid, eventually humans, that would be unnatural, combining humans with animal DNA, for instance. And boy, all of a sudden, Sheila, I was being attacked by the top transhumanists in the world. They were just coming out of the woodwork, guys like... James Hughes, who was the original founder of the World Transhumanist Association, Max Moore, who is considered today to be the father of modern transhumanism. Uh, these guys at their conferences and stuff, they were using Tom Horn as cannon fodder, talking about how I, was, I represented kind of a dangerous segment of society, and I was anti-progressive, I'm a Luddite, I'm against technology, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it eventually ratcheted up until there was a university-level paper that had been written by people that had wrote grants to the NIH, the National Institute of Health, which, as you know, is the largest department in the U.S. government that doles out taxpayer-funded revenue for health-related science and research. And they had written they had written for a grant. They got the grant. They had written some of the uh, language that they hoped would eventually be used to frame how we are going to modify humans in the future, how we're going to use technology via transhumanist aspirations to create a new form of human. Well, I was critical of that NIH report, and man, all of a sudden, now I'm being attacked by guys that are writing for the U.S. government. <laughs> they went over onto the IEET, which is the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, which is today probably the number one transhumanist blog site in the world. And they're over there writing articles about Tom Horn. They're comparing me to the Unabomber, you know, saying that I'm going to get a lot of people killed because I'm standing in the way of this technology. Sheila, I thought, you know what? I'm going to reach out to these people. I'm going to say, look, there's a lot, there's enough people out there today that are becoming hostile. Instead, let me reach across the aisle and say, look, you're never going to convince me of your worldview. I'm probably never going to convince you of mine. But would you be willing to go on film? Because I think. If you're willing to just go on film and, you know, state the facts, the world can judge for itself. Well, that's how this kind of started. So I started traveling across the nation, and I wound up interviewing James Hughes. He and I spent a whole day together at the university where he is a professor and where he teaches. Uh, I wound up traveling to Stanford University on the other end of the spectrum where I got a bioconservative uh, by the name of William Hurlbut, who is a current member of the U.S. President's Council on Bioethics uh, from Stanford to give me the conservative point of view. And, and so I, I, what happened was doors started opening. We wound up with the world's leading transhumanists, 
uh, guys like Hughes, but many others. We've got Hugo de Garris, who's a famous uh, transhumanist who wrote a, the, a book called The Artelect War, but who spent uh, the majority of his adult life, he retired last year, but the majority of his adult life working for China, running actually their artificial brain development center at Zion University in China. Uh, and uh, he is excited about the fact that we're on the cusp of creating strong artificial intelligence, but the downside, he says, is going to lead to a war that that will produce giga death, meaning billions of people are going to die as a result of these strong artificial intelligences coming online. We, he's in our uh, film. Uh, we wound up with other conservatives. And then what we did was we took the world's leading transhumanists. By the way, it's not all male-dominated. We also have Natasha Vita Moore. Uh, the New York Times refers to her as the world's first true uh, female transhumanist philosopher, uh, really well known. Uh, she's in the film too. So we have the we have the world's leading transhumanists. On the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, uh, members of the U.S. President's Council on Bioethics taking the conservative approach. Then what we did, and nothing like this documentary. The documentary is called Inhuman. Nothing like it's ever been produced before because we have the world's leaders on both sides of the issues. But then right in the middle of this, we also went and got who we believe to be the world's most respected Bible scholars. And we asked them a lot of questions about the ethics of altering what it means to be a human. But also we asked them if they thought there might be something prophetic. Uh, in other words, is this Matthew 24, 37? Is this Jesus saying as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. Is that what we're talking about now? And so nothing like this documentary has ever been produced before. It's a three-hour documentary. Right now, by the way, we have a limited time offer where if people go to skywatchtv.com, they'll see a big Christmas ad thing up there on the top of the website. They can click on it. And when they go into that page where all those Christmas ads are, they'll see where if they get the documentary right now, They'll also get two free books on which the documentary is based. One book's called Forbidden Gates. The other one's called Pandemonium's Engine. Both of those are based on transhumanism, the genetics revolution, and so on. And then there's a 270-page teacher's guide in there that breaks down the books and the film into 13 weeks. If there's people that do home studies, Bible studies, churches, or whatever, that want to actually take the documentary and use it to teach 13 weeks to kind of our hope is that churches will get involved in this conversation because if they don't, well, then we're leaving it to the pro-transhumanists to define the language, which right now is at the level of scientists from around the world coming to Washington, D.C., hoping to put out some kind of regulatory uh, uh, information by the spring of 2016 because the technology is here. So when, like you said, this is no longer sci-fi. The technology is actually here now. So this is the time if conservative Christians and other people of faith are going to get involved in this conversation, they, they need to get a quick education and do it now before the language is written by those that are all in favor of it. Well, Tom, as you were talking about transgenics, I mean, we really have arrived at that time spoken about by Jesus Christ as you said as it was in the days of Noah social also the coming of the son of man be the flood came because this whole earth had degenerated into a zoo this morphology of terror and corruption similarly today we have this very intense cross-pollination between the biotech the nanotech altering the genome altering the frequencies of DNA. The Bible really is about protecting the human genome. China creating the first genetically engineered embryo. We see Isaiah seeing something transgenic-like. You talked about the goat animal. Even the London Daily talked about a hybrid chimera. We see these animal-human chimeras. Is there, Tom, a diabolical attempt, do you think, to genetically engineer chimera hybrids, this part human, part animal, even possessed by evil spirits? Is this the insidious part hey, of listen, this? Listen, I know that people listening to this program uh, 
If I tell you, yes, that's happening in, in laboratories around the world now, we're not just talking about at the embryonic level, but literal islands of Dr. Moreau. There will be some people out there that will believe it, and what's ironic is the people that believe it are also the people that are scientists, the ones that are actually involved right. in the technology. They're the ones that know that it's true. Others, though, because of the way the media spins information and news, they're going to say, oh, that's just a conspiracy theory. Oh, it's really not happening. And here's what I would tell you. There, 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 there is major reasons to believe that we have fully mature, let's just call them monstrosities, um, that are being engineered for study purposes that have to do with future military battlefields and so on. By the way, DARPA, this year's presidentially approved DARPA budget, has tens of millions of dollars in it set aside for creating a new blueprint of the human genetic code for super soldier tests. This is in the publicly acknowledged, presidentially approved budget. So we're not talking about sci-fi here. The technology is here. It's being, it's being used. Now, if they're admitting to you in their publicly acknowledged budgets that they want to create a new blueprint for the human to alter our genotype, then imagine what they've been doing for a very long time. And, and here's what I would say, and I would say this, if there's attorneys, legal-minded individuals listening to this program, think about this. In law, you know, there's an investigation, there's a research principle, and it's called a presumption of facts. Now, every attorney out there automatically now is tracking with me. They know exactly where I'm going. Presumption of facts is an argument of proof through inference to the existence of a fact, but that's not certainly known, but about which the existence of a lot of other facts that are known and proved point to, and therefore, it's in law they say it's grounded on circumstantial or probable evidence that therefore entitles certain presumed facts to be believed based on numerous other corroborative, corroborative evidence. Now, first of all, for the lay people listening to this show, that's an established methodology in courts of law all over the world for drawing conclusions that are held up in courts of law all the time, as well as war college, battlefield decisions, and so on, where there is an abundance of evidence that is so clear that reasonable minds, a jury, if you will, can safely assume that the preponderance of evidence has left no space for reasonable doubts. In other words, though Tom Horn might not have a you know, secret camera video footage of a part human, part animal, it is more likely than not to be factual. Why? Number one, because the science exists, and it's overly naive to therefore believe that nobody anywhere is experimenting with it. Number two, governments, including the United States, have a proven track record of always experimenting with exotic <laughs> science, yeah. right? Uh, the Manhattan Project, in top secret, above top secret projects, which quite frankly, they believe they have to do in order to keep their competitors or their enemies from getting ahead of them in the technology. Um, and then number three, we really don't even have to, to doubt because the leaders of national laboratories, global policy think tanks, are admitting that the research is happening. Uh, and I can email this to people that want to email me and ask for it. The 160-page report from the Academy of Medical Sciences out of the United Kingdom. That's the same scientists that were in Washington, D.C. this week meeting with our scientists. But read their report that they published some months ago now called ACHM, which is an acronym which means Animals Containing Human Material. And in that report, they talk about how they believe that there are thousands and thousands of animals containing human material that have been raised to full maturity and that this is happening in laboratories all over the world. And if you read just the summary of the report, just the summary covers these points. Number one, they believe that there is extensive modification of the brains of animals by implantation of human-derived cells that might result, I'm actually reading this from the summary, might result in altered cognitive capacity approaching human consciousness, sentience, and human-like behavioral capabilities. Sheila, now we're talking about eggs, sperm, and where, listen, where fertilization between humans and animal gametes might occur. I mean, we're literally now talking about animals that can conceive from human sperm and give birth to part human, part animals. And then number three in the summary, it's a cellular or genetic modifications that could result in animals with aspects of human-like appearance, skin type, 
limb, facial structure, characteristics such as speech. In other words, we're talking literally, Sheila, about the days of Noah. Wow. This is what happened in the, in the ancient times when the watchers who worked with God in creation came down to the earth. They couldn't do what God did in that they couldn't speak and order that, you know, out of chaos, out of randomness, molecular or atomic structures would come together so that he would say, let there be, and then it would do whatever he told it to do. They couldn't do that, but they could definitely do what our scientists now today can do. They could take existing biological matter and reconstruct it in chimeric fashions, and that's what they did, and they created a biological construct that we call Nephilim, into which they extended themselves, and it came under judgment, and you said that it led to the flood. You're right. In the book of Genesis, that's what it says. All flesh, both man and beast, had been corrupted. And it says of Noah, he was the only man left uh, who was perfect. That's the Hebrew word tanyim, which implies that his DNA had not yet been corrupted through intermarriage, and therefore, by extension, his children. And so God ordered the destruction of all life on earth, both man and beast. Uh, and, then there, and then we started over again. But Jesus said... What was going on in the days of Noah, that's what's going to be going on in the end times when he returns. And now for the first time since the time of the great flood, men have intentionally set about to cross over the species barriers. We're already producing genetically modified crops, transgenic animals, genetically modified humans that the embryonic level have been admitted to for over a decade. And now you have leading scientists that are saying, we suspect that in thousands and thousands of laboratories around the world, we are building islands of Dr. Moreau. It's in DARPA's presidential 2015 and in the upcoming 2016 budget to do so. So um, now, there have been some game changers we can talk about, and this is the one that everybody's hearing about right now. In 2012, U.S. researchers published how they had developed a high-precision gene editing tool called CRISPR-Cas9. I would invite people, again, to go to Google, just type in C-R-I-S-P-R, and Cas9 is the one Cas that they talk about the most. This has opened up whole new realms of genetic engineering. Now, by the end of 2014, last year, researchers at Harvard had used CRISPR technology to develop what they call a gene drive, and I'll explain in a moment why that's important, a gene drive in yeast that became inherited 99% of the time. Now, what do we mean by gene drive? If you're a Darwinian evolutionist and you believe in natural selection, you think that this is what governs the inheritance of genes. If you have a parent that has, let's say, the gene that can give rise to diabetes, you have a 50% chance of inheriting that gene. Now, through gene drive technology, what they do is they create dominant genes that become heritable basically 100% of the time, greater than 99% percent of the time instead of 50 percent of the time. Why is that important? Well, because you could use that technology to literally drive into existence a new form of human because those, that genetic makeup becomes 100 percent inheritable time after time. And by doing that, you literally, that's why it's called gene drive, you drive into existence a new form of that species. Meanwhile, you're also driving out of existence the former version of that species. Now, in order to show a proof of concept, uh, in March of this year, there was a research group at the University of California, San Diego. And again, this can be Googled and people can read this for themselves. They created a gene drive uh, to work in fruit flies. So now we're talking about a much more complex organism than yeast, fruit flies, a living thing. And all they did, their experiment was simple. They just wanted to change the color of the fruit flies from black to, I forget if it was blue or red, but color. And so they created the genetics in the fruit flies to do that, and then they kept them in this controlled environment. And literally overnight, all of the fruit flies that were being born were all being born with this new color and instantly drove into extinction all previous versions of that fruit fly. Now, why is that important? Because this proves that we now have a technology that would allow, once again, for what happened in the days of Noah the creation of a new dominant form of species. And gene drive and CRISPR-Cas9 technology can be used to uh, uh, manipulate the genetics of any living thing 
but in particular, any uh, uh, creation that uses egg or sperm to procreate. So all animals, all humans, can be modified using CRISPR-Cas9 technology, and if you also apply gene drive technology, you can make modifications to the human, which will then be driven in to all downline but we're talking about germline genetic modification. That, that species would replace all previous versions of that species downline. This would be a way to create a new form of human that would replace all existing forms of human into the future. And that's the reason, by the way, that, that this technology now is 99% success rate. They're saying that within another year, by the end of 2016, CRISPR-Cas9 technology will be uh, perfected to the point that you can basically you can just copy paste any new form of a living entity that you want, and it's going to wipe out all previous forms uh, of that species. So we are talking about a world-changing, species-altering, environmental-altering, global technology. Now, the technology is such that it not only could do good, meaning that, and I do think by the way, that there could be some real good things that come out of CRISPR-type technology. We could use uh, gene therapy for creating a treatment for cancer that not only cures cancer, but that assures that it's a permanent cure, that down line, everybody born uh, to those individuals would never even be susceptible to cancer. If you could do that without modifying what it means to be a human, so now we're not talking about a part human, part animal. We're not talking about some other thing that I, as an evangelical Christian, would have real problems with. We're talking about gene therapy. We're just talking about therapy. It's, in other words, it's a super advanced, much better way of doing what we already do, what we already do, you know, using um, nuclear, um, you know, uh, treatments to try to kill cancerous cells. The problem, though, is that what can be used for good can also be used for evil and gene drive could also be used to build for instance a terrifying bioweapon a terrorist would not need to create vast amounts of a lethal virus to unleash on the world if they can just take a handful of mosquitoes and with a gene for making a toxin and power it with a gene drive and release them into the florida keys Within six months, you could have mosquitoes propagating across the United States and then around the world that have in them a toxin that would be lethal to humanity. And by the time the CDC and other agencies of our governments caught up with the fact that you have a new form of flu or whatever they would be calling it, you could have tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people around the world dead as a result of this technology. Now, let me tell you the reason that this is especially scary. I have in my possession right now a gene knockout CRISPR-Cas9 kit. And if Tom Horn can get this kit, you better believe the terrorist communities can get it. And they can use it for gene drive technology. And, oh, by the way, Sheila, people knew that all these scientists were meeting in Washington, D.C. last week, but they had no idea the level at which these scientists are concerned. And I had said at Skywatch TV that I expected that they were going to call for a universal moratorium on the use of the science. And I had said it won't make any difference because two things. Number one, rogue nations aren't going to pay no attention to our call for a universal moratorium. They're just going to use the science if they want to. But secondly, there's a proven track record in the United States, Britain, and other Western countries that we too, we'll, we're signatories of the moratorium. We'll say we're putting a moratorium on it, and then we just go into, you know, SAPOC-type budgets beyond congressional review, and we develop the science anyway. Why? Well, because our experience tells us that we have to develop the technology if for no other reason than to be able to counteract it if, if you know, enemies or competitors try to use the technology against us. So uh, what I find interesting is that the very scientists in Washington, D.C. last week were referring to this as a Pandora's box. That was their language. They're actually calling this a Pandora's box, and they're saying there is no way to put the genie back in the bottle now. The technology does exist. So we're, we are, I think, at a time where prophecy is in fact being fulfilled, 
And it's only probably the mercy of God that we haven't yet seen this technology used in catastrophic ways. Well, you're right, because when you look at this eclectic mishmash of the who's who of the New World Mad Scientists, you know, creating these animal-human chimeras and then DARPA projects, it's hard to believe, Tom, that you had a time when unsanctioned Nephilim, or what I like to call human-angel hybrids, these things aren't human. And it's just like what you just said. At what point does it mean that we're not even human anymore? It's frightening. And then earlier you mentioned Ray Kurzweil, who's, of course, emerged as the major spokesperson for the transhumanist movement, Mr. Singularity. He's credited with saying, consider how often you update the software on your computers, yet the software on our bodies, they haven't been updated for millennia, and it's now obsolete. So humans fundamentally have these design flaws and damage design. I mean, transhumanism, as you'll agree, Tom, views sickness and aging as unnecessary hindrances that we have the right and the responsibility to overcome because our we're just too frail, too fat, too slow, too too dumb. I mean, our body's computers do for an upgrade. That's frightening that Christians support this as well, Tom. Yeah, there is actually there's a growing Christian transhumanist uh, movement. We deal with all of this stuff in the film Inhuman. The fact that bioenhanced humans with Ray Kurzweil, you were talking about he, his whole thing about cognitive abilities are going to be enhanced. We're going to have nanobots swimming around in our body, making molecular repairs. Look again, I think I think that Ray Kurzweil gets a lot right. I think the transhumanist community gets a lot right. Uh, I think that they're way ahead of the church in imagining the future and what the future is going to look like if the Lord should tarry. I, I do believe that we are entering into what even the technologists are calling the hybrid age. And by that, what they mean, again, go to Google, type in hybrid age, you'll see where technologists, and we're talking about MIT-level technologists, futurists, Oxford University professors, high-level university professors saying we're now entering in to the hybrid age. And what they mean by that is exactly what it sounds like. They're saying that, especially in Western countries, if the first wave was agrarian and tribal, uh, the second wave was industrial and national, the third was informational and transnational, gave birth to the Internet, that we're now entering into the fourth wave, the hybrid age. And by that, they mean that in this new era, human evolution is going to become human technology co-evolution. We're going to become part of the machine, a la Ray Kurzweil's vision of, of the future. The machine is going to become part of us, but we're also going to modify ourselves at the genetics level in order to accommodate our you know, integration with becoming the Borg. Um, is that all just sci-fi? No, we're actually already doing it. We, we've created, in, in terms of pharmaceuticals, we've created uh, legs, artificial legs, artificial arms now that are being controlled by brainwave, by thought alone. So the technology already is happening. And to the extent that we could help a, a war veteran that comes back from a battlefield that lost his legs in battle, get a new leg that he can control with his brain, I'm all about that as long as, again, we're not talking about literally creating the Borg brain chip interfacing that also then allows the government to somehow interface, to control, to monitor our brain waves. So there's a very there's a very thin line here that becomes concerning. The difference between a new modern form of a wheelchair that actually really helps somebody that's been damaged to be able to get around and do better, I'm all for. Integration with with surveillance systems and data mining systems, I'm not for. Or take it to the genetics level. Uh, a new form of therapy. I mean, every time you take an aspirin, you're trying to affect your genetics. You're trying to do something that is therapeutic. And Christians have been at the forefront of this effort long before the transhumanist community ever even had an identity or a name. We built all the great hospitals. We took the commission of Jesus Christ to be healers. We took that very seriously. We've been out there feeding the hungry and helping the poor and healing the sick and tending to the wounded. That is an ethos that is important to our Christian worldview. But we also believe in the divine order, meaning that it was God who created everything before the fall, and he ordered that each kind reproduce only 
after its own kind. And this becomes a real problem with the transhumanists. You'll see some of them, uh, Natasha Vita Moore, in our documentary film, talking about how she's looking forward to the day when she can create a system that will allow her to take on serpentine-like qualities. She wants her skin to glow, you know, and to change like a mood ring. And, and all these stuff that, you know, people are going to watch this and they're going to go, these people are out of their ever-loving mind. And yet they're not, because the technology to do it is actually here. And we are now starting down this road toward, well, you mentioned the Chinese. The Chinese were only one of the first ones to admit that they're using CRISPR-Cas9 technology to modify humans at the germline level, at the genetic level. And they say that, you know, after they did their experiments, then they destroyed those embryos. I don't know whether they did or didn't. I'll just take their word, you know, for what they say. But the bottom line is, if there are others that are doing the same thing, if there are others that are raising these to maturity, then those genetically modified humans breeding with non-genetically modified humans with gene drive technology are going to be permanently altering everything born down the line. This sounds exactly like what the Watchers did, doesn't it? What the Nephilim did. That ultimately led to the fiat of the Great Flood. But it's happening now. Now, I'll tell you something that, that also really concerns me. Well, two things. The Chinese that did these tests, editing with embryos using CRISPR, reported a high success ratio. Well, in their mind, that's a wonderful thing. But in the mind of a conservative bioethicist, they just crossed over a line that ethicists have been concerned about for many, many years called germline genetic engineering. Why? Because germline genetic engineering actually has the potential to achieve the goals of the early eugenics movement. And if you recall, eugenics was the idea that we're going to create superior humans via improving their genetics through selective breeding. So this was being done in the United States early in our history, but all the way up until 1970, there were laws in some states still on the books that would allow them to, to sterilize individuals that they thought were not qualified to have babies. So, I mean, this has been around even in the recent years. Hitler, of course, took it to the, you know, to the highest level, who thought that through genetically selecting individuals to be born from people that they considered their bloodlines to be the best, we're going to, you know, we're going to create the Aryan super race. Well, now, through genetically modifying human genes in very early embryos, sperm and eggs, germline engineering has the power to accomplish what Hitler set out, to actually reassemble the very nature of humanity as human, altering an embryo's every cell, leading to inheritable modifications that would extend to all succeeding uh, generations. And there are very intelligent people that actually support doing that. Uh, there, if people Google Dr. Gregory Stock, he's a, a leading respected proponent of germline technology. He believes that we can choose now to transcend our existing biological limitations like Kurzweil was talking about, and we're going to do it through germline engineering. And his whole argument is that we can make better humans by adding new genes to their DNA, then uh, we should. And he, he frankly argues in a way that really appeals to the average individual, the man on the street, to transhumanists, to secularists, because he says there's no way we've spent billions and billions of dollars to unravel our biology. We didn't do it out of idle curiosity. We did it in the hopes of bettering our lives. And now that we have the technology, we're not going to turn away from it. And he's right, we're not. But here's the, here's the thing, Sheila, that most of these technologists don't understand, is that there is also a spiritual, supernatural aspect of who we are and what we are as humans. It makes us different than a tree. It makes us different than other things that could be genetically modified. And according to Scripture and according to really uh, religious philosophers down through the eons, our peculiar, particular genetic design is also connected to our supernatural relationship with God. God made it, and God breathed into humanity the breath of life, and he made us a fit extension for habitation by the Holy Spirit. Now, what we found, and I, I kind of already knew this existed, but I was astonished at the level at which it exists, what we found when traveling across the country over the last five years making the Inhuman documentary is that there's also a lot of transhumanists who 
either believe in or are suspicious that there is an unseen reality around us. You and I would say the angelic realm, the supernatural realm. They believe that there is an unseen reality around us, and they are very interested in getting in contact with it. Now, not all transhumanists, some of them are completely atheist, secularist, whatever, but a lot of them have a spiritual side, but it's not Bible-based. And so, like, uh, one of the transhumanists that we deal with is Nick Bostrom. He's the, the uh, Future of Humanity Institute professor and a uh, philosophy professor at Oxford University. He actually wrote how he earned his prestigious seat at Oxford University, but was by writing a thesis called Transhumanist Values. He's a leading advocate of transhumanism. Interestingly, in recent days, he also has developed a second side of him that almost sounds more like Tom Horn, in which he's saying, he, he's saying he's a leading advocate of transhumanism. However, he also believes it might lead to the end of the world. <laughs> it's, an, it's an existential risk. But what makes him different is that he actually envisions remanufacturing humans, which we're already doing now. We're doing this in laboratories around the world. The, the ACHM report by the Academy of Medical Sciences out of Britain, which is equivalent to our FDA here in the United States, says that they think there's laboratories all over the world that are doing this now to full maturity, not just at the embryonic level. They're actually growing part human, part animal monstrosities in laboratory settings. Well, Bostrom believes that that is going to allow us to make contact with the other side. If you go to his website, nickbostrom.com, scroll down and find his original theses, which he has published online, it's called Transhumanist Values. And read it and, and look at how he talks about how future humans, we're going to combine our genetic makeup with animals, plants, synthetic life forms, all that. And what he talks about over there is how in the animal kingdom, some animals have sonar, they have magnetic orientation. They have sensors for electricity and vibration. They have these extra-human abilities. Uh, he talks about how they, they have a range of sensory modalities where they can see into areas of the light spectrum that we can't see into. And he talks about how the uh, transhuman forms of, of mankind in the future are not going to have limits to our range of modalities like we do now, Our five, what people call our five senses, you know, taste, see, smell. Um, we're going to add things to those sensory modalities, um, infrared ability, radiation, sonar, like bats use for uh, navigation, or infrared like snakes use for seeing. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to connect that to our makeup and be able to see into other realms and other realities. Well, here's what I want people to know. Nick Bostrom's absolutely correct in that the animal kingdom does have levels of perception that are way beyond human. A lot animals can, they can sense earthquakes. We say they can smell tumors. We don't know if that's really what they're doing, but some dogs are sensitive to when people have cancer. Dogs can hear at 40,000 hertz, dolphins at 80,000 hertz, that sort of thing. But we also believe that animals see wavelengths into a realm that you and I might call the spirit world. Remember the story of Balaam's donkey in the book of Numbers. And Balaam has done something God told him not to do, and he's prophesied against Israel. He's fleeing for his life, and he's on a donkey. And the donkey keeps turning off the path that he's on, and he keeps beating the donkey, trying to get it back on the path. But what he can't see is the reason the donkey's turning off the path is the donkey can see ahead, in the pathway is a giant angel with a sword drawn going to take off dumb Balaam's head. <laughs> so so you, have a, you have a biblical precedent for suggesting that some animals can see into what you and I would call the supernatural realm. And transhumanists have a significant interest in combining our genetic makeup with the animal kingdom uh, in order to be able to see into those other realms. There's a there was a, a famous transhumanist that died a couple of years ago, Terence McKenna. He was actually the originator of what's called novelty theory, and people can Google that and read about it. But he, he was a guy that would go around the world into Africa and different places and use these mind-expanding drugs that the shaman were using to put himself into contact with the other side. And he believed that he was consistently being put in contact with entities that were 
every time he went into these altered state of minds, these entities were the same. In other words, he didn't. He came to believe that these were not just uh, illusions from psychoactive drugs, but rather that it was opening a gateway in his brain to allow him to perceive other realities. And he believed that following technological singularity, we were going to uh, be able, would have the the technology to be able to enhance our brain matter in order to constantly have like a stable platform to be in constant contact with the other side. Well, around the time that he was writing about that, Arizona State University, where the Templeton Foundation had been funding a whole series of mostly pro-transhumanist lectures titled Facing the Challenges of Transhumanism, Religion, Science, and Technology. They're still doing that. Um, some of the instructors around that time said they believed that radical alteration of mankind might open a door to unseen intelligence. And so consequently, in 2009, Arizona State University launched a new study called the SOFIA Project for the express purpose of confirming and then perhaps putting ourselves into contact with, and they described what they wanted to get in contact with, quote, deceased people, spirit guides, angels, otherworldly entities, extraterrestrials, and or a universal intelligence or God, In quote. So they wanted to put themselves in contact with what you and I would call the supernatural realm. Now, when they did that, I went on national television, was talking about it. They pulled the Sophia webpage from Arizona State University because they were getting so much feedback as a result of me doing a national television program on it, big time television. But you can still go in and find the cache in Google. I don't know about Yahoo, but you can do it in Google where you can see the web page up there for the Sophia project. But the whole point is, imagine then, and we do in the documentary in Human Imagine, what this might mean if you have government laboratories with unlimited budgets that have been working beyond congressional review for the last 20 years, in which they're trying to decode gene functions that lead animals to have these, what we would call preternatural capabilities of sense and smell and sight, if they were doing that and then blending that with Homo sapiens. Well, we believe that original man, Eve, wasn't surprised that the Nakash was in the garden, the serpent in the garden, because Adam and Eve in their original and fallen state could see into what we call the supernatural realm. Adam and Eve could speak to the animals, and they would do what they told them to do. After the fall, Adam becomes Amon, man of rare earth, and different diophonetic marks that were previously attached to his name that suggest that he had godlike abilities of speech and sound, of speech and uh, eyesight, are removed from Adam. He becomes something different. He becomes what we are today, suggesting that there are portions of our brain. We know that we don't use the majority of our brain. Portions of the brain are closed off. Well, what these modern, spiritually inclined transhumanists and scientists believe is that maybe, just maybe, there are portions of the brain. And if they could be reactivated, in other words, if we could circumvent the curse that God put on man, we could reactivate the original qualities and therefore, I guess, use more of a percentage of our brain. But I think as you call them, these so-called spiritually inclined people, you're talking about their form of spirituality, the spirits they're seeking to tap into, maybe something beside God. So they may be in for quite a surprise, Tom, when they try to unleash what's on the other side of that veil. Now, speaking of the other side of that veil, I want you to tell the listeners about an incredible situation with your mother recently, Tom. Yeah, I mean, this it was a shocker. Uh, my sister calls me one day who takes care of my mother. Uh, lives with her and takes care of her. My sister also has health issues. Mom's freaking out. On the phone, I almost couldn't even put together exactly what they were talking about, but because I already had a trip to Arizona planned, I just decided to go down there. I told them just, I'll be there. I'm getting there as quick as I can. Well, what I found out when I got there is my mom, who's nearly 90 years old now, um, what happened was she had started seeing red spots in her right eye, right? So she goes to the doctor. She's seeing these spots in this eye, can't get rid of them. And the doctor tells her that he wants to try a new experimental 
eye drop. So she signs the paperwork that gives him permission to do it. And he tells her, he says, now this is going to burn like fire for a few minutes. But then he said, I think it'll fix a problem. So he puts the eye drops in her eye, covers her eye with a gauze and a patch, and he tells her not to remove the patch until the following day. Sure enough, she says it does burn like fire for a couple of hours. Then eventually it stops hurting. She's got the patch on her eye. She goes home. The next day, she removes the patch. And Sheila, she's nearly knocked out of her wheelchair. Why? Because she can see people. She called them strange-looking people that are standing and walking through her house. Wow. She says, this is not like a dream. This is not like some gray, misty, you can't quite make out, and so your, your brain's doing that trick like you do with clouds where you can see faces in the clouds. This is not like that. This is vivid. This is three-dimensional. They are literally walking through her house. She covers the bad eye, and she doesn't see anything with the other eye, the left eye. Covers up the left eye and opens the right eye, and these beings are walking through her house. Now, it's the reason they call me, uh, or part of the reason they call me, is because all of a sudden, these entities that are walking through her house, they notice that she can see them. She's looking at them. They notice she can see Now, they stop, and they start walking over by her, and they're looking at her as if they are cognitively recognizing that she can see these entities. Uh, that completely freaks her out. She closes her eye, but she knows they're there. She puts the patch back on her eye, but she knows they're there. Freaking out, calls me. Can't get a hold of me, by the way, because I was on a trip. They didn't get a hold of me for several days. Um, takes the patch back off, starts praying. My mom's very religious and Abe Lincoln honest, and starts praying. And all of a sudden as she's praying, she says this really young, beautiful man walks into the room. He looks like he might be 25 years old or something. Walks into the room and sits down on the couch next to her. She's in a wheelchair that's backed up by the couch. Sits on the couch next to her. And somehow she knows everything's okay. She don't even know how she knows it, but she senses it. Everything's okay. There's no danger here. Nothing can touch me. Nothing can happen. Still wants to talk to me about it, but now she's not freaked out. And for nine days, this young, beautiful man, as she describes him, sits right next to her while these beings are walking back and forth through her house. And uh, on the eighth day, they start getting a little bit hazy. On the ninth day, she can hardly detect that they're even there any longer. Uh, and by, the, by that evening, she goes to sleep. When she wakes up the next day, they're gone. She hasn't seen them again. The big question, though, and as you know, I talked about this on another national television program 10 days ago or so. And guess what, Sheila? I talked about that on that program. I got contacted by probably a dozen or so people that actually work in the medical field. Two of them were doctors. One of them was an RN and others that just say they work in nursing and whatever, and all of them saying, Tom, the situation with your mom is real. They said, this experimental drug is being used right now, and we are getting similar reports that sound exactly like what your mom experienced that are coming in now from all over the nation. Well, the, the question, Sheila, is what in the world kind of an eye drop could be being tested right now that appears to be allowing people to see into what you and I would call the supernatural realm. Is it just a fluke? Is it a mistake? What's going on? I wanted to know, and as you know, you know, Skywatch Television, we have on staff full-time Sharon Gilbert, who is a molecular biologist. I sent it to her. I said, Sharon, I said, what in the world do you think, what's going on here? I mean, Mom absolutely would never make something up. <laughs> so I'm um, not telling a lie, and now it's being confirmed. Uh, what do you think's going on? And Sharon emailed me back, and she said, Tom, ophthalmologists are dealing with this right now, and they're saying that these so-called visions or whatever, she said they're, they're calling this Charles Bennett syndrome. Wow. And they're saying that it's a manifestation of the brain's reaction to sensory deprivation, the eye being occluded artificially by... Uh, covering or physiologically through disease, whatever. She says, Tom, it's a bunch of scientific claptrap. It's a lie. They're trying to simply explain experiences to their patients and tell them that there's nothing happening here that's beyond physical 
reality, this is kind of like phantom limb sensations when an individual loses an arm and they still feel the arm, blah, 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 uh, but it's going on for eyes. She said, Tom, I suspect your mom saw into the spirit realm for reasons that we, I don't understand, you don't understand. And then she goes on to this big, long email about how it's well-timed because she's spending a great deal of time right now dealing with uh, this very phenomenon and others similar to it that are being reported and that she's receiving from people uh, around the world. But the only thing I can imagine is that the young man was an angelic manifestation, and he was just there to assure my mother, who is a Christian, that whatever this other manifestation is can't touch you, can't hurt you, but it is part of another kind of reality. Well, of course, then that takes us to other programs we've done in the past where what's going on at CERN, they're trying to open a doorway into a parallel reality. Top leading minds in the world, quantum physicists, believe that we are living in a multiverse. And by multiverse, they don't just mean cosmic radiation left over from the Big Bang and there's light particles floating around out there that we can't see. When you watch their documents and their videos and their, you know, their discussions around what is happening in the multiverse, they depict other people like us living parallel to us, you know, being separated by light or whatever, embranes, gravitational uh, situations in which we cannot see their light and therefore we can't, we're not aware that they're there. They're really just describing what the Bible calls the supernatural realm. And even CERN is trying to make contact uh, with that reality. Wow. Well, I don't know what's in those eye drops, but frightening concoction indeed. I mean, between tampering with the human genome and this hellish cornucopia of sorcery, witchcraft, pharmacia, opening portals, messing around with what we shouldn't be, we've really crossed over into an area where I believe there's no going back here. Pandora's box has been opened. And I really believe, Tom, that the subtitle of your documentary, The Next and Final Phase of Man, is here. And it's almost inconceivable to think that we could soon merit the label post-human. I feel this is so important that people get this documentary. I've watched it. It's incredible. And I do hope the churches get involved. Christians should be in an uproar about this. And again, Tom, I want to thank you for five long years of incredible research and the documentation that you've put into this movie. I know that you had a lot more information that was cut way down to put into this three-hour DVD set. And I just think the information is absolutely vital. Such an amazing job, such a compilation. It's a two-disc set DVD. Folks, you have to get this. Tom, in the waning moments, tell us again about this limited-time, unprecedented deal you have going on. Yeah, and that's really what we're hoping people will do, especially the church. It is urgent that the church, and especially conservative believers, get involved uh, in this discussion. And it's not difficult. All they need is a basic education about the science and the technology and what is happening. They'll get that. If they watch the documentary, the, the book Forbidden Gates is an award-winning book on which this film is based. The 270-page teacher's guide is based on that book. And if there are churches out there that, that, that get this package, they buy the documentary film, they're going to get this other stuff free. They're going to get the book Forbidden Gates free. They're going to get Pandemonium's Engine free. They're going to get the 270-page uh, teacher's guide free with the film documentary. If they watch it and if churches want to use this to teach a 13-week course, they can get a hold of me. I'm happy to provide them any of the other curriculum they want. I won't charge them. I'll just send it to churches and, and home study groups so that they can do a 13-week study. And by the time they come out of the backside of this, they will thoroughly understand what it took me, you know, the, the last decade, essentially, and especially the last five years of my life to comprehend. They also will they'll have a sense of urgency about getting involved in the conversation, but they'll also know how to do it because the curriculum also teaches how they can effectively get involved all the way from grandmothers who can't do anything more than pray, but now they'll know how to pray, 
all the way up to educators who can write grant applications to you know departments of the U.S. government so that they too can weigh in on the ethics, how to do radio, television, and so on, so they can so they can discuss these issues. The time to get involved is now. If you don't get involved now, uh, you're probably going to just be left on the fringe and really not have an effective voice in this conversation. So the time to do it is right now. Now, if they want to go to skywatchtv.com, skywatchtv.com, they'll see a big Christmas ad. I don't think it even says anything about the documentary, but it's on the top of the web page. Click on it. It'll take you to the page where you can get the Inhuman documentary and the other free stuff, the free books and the teacher's guide with it. If you don't want to do that, if you're listening to this and you live in some other country, you also can get the Inhuman documentary uh, through Amazon, so it can be you know, sent into your local area. And then I'd be happy to email you the PDF of the teacher's guide so that you could do that in foreign countries if the shipping is too expensive to your where you live in the world. Hey, Sheila, thank you for having me on your program. As always, you two are on the cutting edge. Thank you, Tom. And again, kudos for your incredible work. I'm such a huge fan of yours. You're a brilliant, inspiring man. Please do come back and see us soon, Tom. I'm looking forward to it. And also, as you promised, you're going to come after the first of the year and be on Skywatch TV. We're going to talk about a different subject that's also in the news right now, having to do with Gaia worship, with the push to internationalize environmentalism. You wrote the book on it. I'm looking forward to having you on our television program to talk about it. Very much looking forward to it. Thank you, Tom. Folks, that was Dr. Tom Horn. Get this documentary, folks, Inhuman. The next and final phase of man is here. Go to skywatchtv.com. Do make sure you sign up for my YouTube channel and social media like Facebook and Twitter. All that information is there at weekendvigilante.com. Thank you so much for tuning into the broadcast from around the globe.